I'm happy to introduce Bruce Hawkins, who will be presenting his uh, presentation paper, A Case History of a Successful Reliability Journey. Uh, Bruce is a uh, management consultant with more than 43 years of experience implementing systems of process, uh, targeted at improving machinery reliability, 24 years as a practitioner holding positions from engineer to maintenance manager to corporate reliability leader, 20 years as a consultant with extensive experience in helping clients achieve significantly improved operating results while dramatically reducing costs. A broad background in training client personnel and maintenance management, root cause analysis, reliability centered maintenance analysis, planning and scheduling, and other technical disciplines. Uh, is an active participant in SMRP's uh, overall in his local chapter. I'm handing so, it over to Bruce. Carolina's chapter. Okay. Yep. Carolina chapter. All right. Thank you. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a departure from what you normally see in these things because I'm going to tell you a story. And it's a story that uh, helped provide excellent business value for the uh, uh, for the companies, the, the plants that implemented it. But it's also going to tell you the story of shaping the careers of many of the individuals who participated in that journey, two of which are in this room uh, uh, besides me. Uh, John, would you stand up, please? This is, this is John Cray. He also went through this journey. So if any questions come up that he needs to address, uh, I'm going to I'm going to delegate to him, and also Sam McNair down here in the front. Sam McNair was one of the targets. Okay, so yeah, so so at any rate, we'll we'll ask them to provide some color if necessary if questions come up uh, because uh, I think what we did was pretty unique, uh, and maybe you can learn some lessons to help you along your journey as well. So, uh, like I said, I'm an old guy, uh, but one of the keys from this slide is, is that I was the ninth person globally to earn my CMRP certification. Um, the reason I did that is because I was part of the certification committee when we first went live with the certification. And the certification committee people were the first ones to get, um, to get certified. I wish I'd have had 007, that would have been pretty cool. But anyway. It was ninth person, and I've actually been an SMRP volunteer on several committees, the board, SMRPCO, uh, currently with, uh, with uh, liaison to the Global Forum on Maintenance and Asset Management and the World Partners in Asset Management, and been doing that since 1999 in an unbroken streak. So uh, SMRP has been a big part of my life. So the situation we found ourselves in. We were a seven site division in, in, as part of a major chemical company, all based in the Southeast region of the United States, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, seven plants. Uh, all the sites were primarily reactive. Uh, they, they did very little proactive activities. A uh, few of them did very much predictive maintenance at the time we started this. Um, our leadership got a hold of a, a report by the Chemical Ma uh, Manufacturers Association that showed that we were 11th out of 11 companies in maintenance spending as a percentage of replacement asset value. Okay, so we were dead last. And that was kind of untenable. So our operating costs were high. In good years, we made a little bit of money. Bad years, we broke even or maybe even lost a little money. But, but, um, Clearly, big change was needed. Uh, the reactive nature of our sites meant that we had lots of resources on shift. We couldn't trust our assets to run uh, overnight without somebody having being there to provide constant attention. Uh, we had high overtime rates, and we didn't have any, any real process metrics in place. So our leadership then decided to re-engineer our maintenance, procurement, and reliability processes. And this was true re-engineering where you take out a blank sheet of paper and redesign your processes and implement those processes as opposed to re-engineering used as a euphemism for headcount reduction, okay? This was true re-engineering, re which 
which uh, I think set us up for the best chance of success. Um, the, the, what we, the, the, we created a future state design team, taking some 40 individuals from the various plants to actually conduct, conduct benchmarking activities. John was one of those guys. So if you wanna know anything about what, you know, what they did, how they benchmarked uh, and, and all that, he's the guy to ask, okay? So they, they looked for companies that were near world-class performance, figured out how they got there, what characteristics of their organizations were in place. And uh, they distilled this information down into a future state design. And the goal was to get a uh, significant maintenance cost reduction and operational performance efficiency improvements. So uh, the future state design included really four major focus areas. One of them was maintenance, one of them was procurement, another one was the organizational structure and the reporting uh, roles and responsibilities, and finally the use of technology. So those were the four main focus areas uh, that, that we went after. So as far as maintenance was concerned, we wanted to implement uh, predictive maintenance broadly through our asset base to move to more of a condition monitoring approach rather than the time-based approach that most of the sites were operating in if they did much PM at all. Uh, we want to implement a structured work management process that included planning and scheduling so we could gain some efficiencies with workforce utilization. We wanted to make some enhancements to the preventive maintenance program uh, to make it more effective. Uh, we wanted to uh, implement reliability-centered maintenance where it made sense on our critical systems. We wanted to implement some type of operator care strategy, uh, and we called it the autonomous maintenance pillar of the TPM philosophy. And finally, we wanted to use, uh, have the use of a knowledge bank. We wanted to share information across these seven sites where we had common equipment and common systems so we could get some key learnings and not have to reinvent the wheel at each site, gain some efficiencies that way. In the procurement, Thing. We did some pretty cool things in the procurement world. We did some vendor consolidation. We were a big company acting like a small company. Um, we had some 5,000 suppliers across those seven sites. When you look at all the mom and pop shops that each site dealt with, you know, so uh, we, we embarked on an effort to uh, narrow that down to a few thousand, which were mainly OEMs. But then we had, we discovered, or we set up about a dozen commodity suppliers for pipe valves and fittings, power transmission equipment, um, uh, electrical equipment, that type of stuff, and put corporate agreements in place with those, with those organizations. So we gained a lot of leverage going to that. Uh, leverage in both pricing and also service. And I'll mention service a little bit later. Um, but this was not without its change management issues. You know, the folks at the site like their ball caps and coffee cups from their mom and pop suppliers. So we had a lot of resistance we had to manage around this. But, but this did provide us a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of business benefit because about 80 to 85% of our spending was with those 12 suppliers. Okay, um, we implemented point of use storerooms that we call supply stations, where uh, they were in areas where it made sense, but it was inventoried and controlled just like the main storeroom. Uh, so this reduced a lot of travel time on the part of our craftspeople to get parts. Um, uh, most had attendance on day shift uh, and they were locked on night shift. So the security was controlled. We attempted to standardize on parts and equipment so that we, we reduced our supplier base in that and we could, we could leverage a lot, of, um, a lot of service enhancements. For example, we standardized on one brand of mechanical seal and the mechanical seal supplier uh, actually put a mechanical seal repair shop at one facility that had the highest mechanical seal usage, 
where they would repair the seals, but also help us with root cause analysis of why the seals failed. That was free service to us that we got by having them um, uh, getting all of our mechanical seal business. All right. We had automated purchasing and payment. So we took a lot of work out of the, of the purchasing and payment processes. And we also implemented kitting for planned work. And uh, Sam, I think your site probably did it the best with that external uh, kitting area, okay? So those were the procurement design elements. The organizational design elements were, the sites were all over the map as far as their organization types were. Some were centralized, some were decentralized. Uh, some even went to a self-directed work team type environment, which does not work for maintenance, I can tell you <laughs> from experience. Um, so we uh, settled on a philosophy of centralized control, but decentralized execution. One leadership group, but shops in the areas where they made sense. These are relatively large plants that we were dealing with. We had well-defined job roles, uh, responsibilities, and expectations for uh, the maintenance managers, the supervisors, planner schedulers, reliability engineers. A lot of our sites did not have reliability engineers. We implemented that role uh, with, uh, with focused analysis capabilities. We developed a centralized corporate purchasing. Uh, and primarily, uh, there was a commodity manager at corporate for each one of those dozen score suppliers that managed that relationship. And also, uh, they, they, they also uh, worked very well with the vendors to catch us on mistakes, like when somebody made a unit of measure ordering error, like ordered a thousand cases of something as opposed to a thousand items of something. So um, they helped prevent some of that stuff. Um, there was minimal staff at sites. There was generally one purchasing agent at the site to handle those one-offs and also to handle any capital purchases for the site and a clerk to help feed the computer beast, okay? And then in the element of technology, we implemented uh, consistent predictive technologies across the seven sites. Whereas before those that had it, they were kind of all over the board as far as brands were concerned, but we wanted the ability to again, share knowledge and, sh and share learnings across the sites. So, we implemented a, a standardization of those tools and, and uh, software. We also implemented SAP. And this was back when, when SAP uh, was not the system of choice. I don't know if it is today, but it was certainly not the system of choice at that time. Even the long text fields in SAP would not word wrap in the version that we implemented. Okay, you had to type to the end of the row and hit the return key to get to the next line. So it was a uh, it was, it was a, a challenge from a change management perspective is, uh, uh, as you would imagine. But we had support from the corporate basis team that helped us with report development, that helped us with, with functionality enhancement. For example, that version of SAP did not have automatic notification when a, a planner had put in a requisition and a purchase order going out to a vendor they didn't have any automatic delivery receipt notification. Well, we were able to create a workaround by that corpus, corporate basis team by uh, creating a batch report that ran every night that looked at all work orders that had the status of waiting for material, examined all the purchase orders associated with those work orders. When they were all complete, it automatically flipped the, the, the status over to ready to schedule. So that meant the planners didn't have to go remember to go check their PO status each and every time and waste a lot of time. Uh, they were able to do mass data loads um, uh, when, when necessary and also provide user training. So I think that part of it was, was uh, having that basis team in place was one of the keys to our success. So the approach that we took to implementation was very aggressive. We roll that out to seven sites over the course of one year. I was at the first site, okay? And it wasn't easy. We went live on Christmas day in SAP, okay? So 
Each site was expected to develop its own business case. I did that for our site. And here's a lesson learned. When you, when you create a business case that exposes that there's a huge opportunity for uh, a positive impact, don't believe that that message is going to be necessarily perceived all that well. Because I, I took the approach of looking at where we stood on maintenance spending as a percentage of replacement value versus best in class to define that maintenance spending reduction opportunity, but also did some extensive OEE calculations by looking at, all right, what's our best month of production in each one of the operating areas. If you could do it for a month, you ought to be able to do it for a year. So I defined that business opportunity. Then I took that, those numbers, cut them in half, and said, man, that's still too big. Cut them in half again. So I went and presented that to the leadership team, and they laughed me out of the room. They could not believe that they were mismanaging the resources of that site to that greater degree. Now, I got the last laugh because in the third year, we're surpassed that business case and kept on going. So, all right, so just expect that. So, uh, we assign process experts to conduct training and ongoing support for the autonomous maintenance uh, pillar of, of TPM, reliability centered maintenance. I was the RCM guy. I got trained by uh, Jack Nicholas, who the the Jack and Dorothy Nicholas Scholarship Award was named for, um, and it was my responsibility to train the other sites. Uh, uh, John had, had the, the responsibility to train everybody on how to manage maintenance effectively. Um, we, we had a planning and scheduling resource, and we had uh, resources to help us with SAP usage. Now, the initial results, results we found were very, very positive. We got very enthusiastic support from operations for, their, uh, for the autonomous maintenance pillar because now the operators had a, a, a better way to get work, to get their stuff fixed, if you will. And um, we had some low hanging fruit that provided some real early savings. And we got it from both the autonomous maintenance piece and from the, the RCM piece. Uh, an example from the autonomous maintenance piece, the uh, consulting company that helped us with that helped us with implementation of that had the philosophy of, okay, you shut the machine down, you clean the machine, you bring it up in the evening, let it run overnight, you shut it back down the next day and inspect it, and you can see where all the contamination is coming from, where the leaks are. Well, we had one particular piece of equipment that I, I actually participated in the workshop for that piece of equipment. And it was a roll stand with about you know a dozen rolls on it, all geared together. And this gear case was splash lubricated. Well, when we were doing the initial cleaning, there was a lot of oil under the machine. And this had been a chronic problem for years. Uh, there was, we had a lot of oil leaks with this machine and we had several others like it and they also had oil leaks. So we had tried different gasketing and all that kind of stuff. Nothing ever worked. So um, again, this gear case was splash lubricated. So we, we, uh, we get all that clean. We start the machine up, runs overnight, shut it back down, and there's a huge puddle of oil underneath the machine again. We get to doing some investigation. The operators were responsible for topping off the gear case but they were doing it while the machine is running when all this oil is splashing up in the gear cake, the gear train. And when they shut it down, oil runs out of the vent hole in the, in the sight glass. They were actually supposed to top, top it off when it was still, when it was not running, okay? So it was just an education thing that it caused us to waste thousands of dollars of, of synthetic oil, all right? That was one low hanging fruit. The, the other, one, the one in RCM, there was a chronic issue with a, with a condensing system that was supposed to help pull a vacuum on a process vessel. Uh, never could get it to, to get down to the right level of vacuum. 
And we found that, that during the, the RCM analysis, having the operators, some experienced operators on there, said, you know, we used to clean out the spray nozzles on that spray condenser periodically, but we don't do that anymore. Where they weren't getting good spray efficiency, so it was, it was carrying over some condensables into the, to the uh, steam ejectors that were supposed to get rid of the non-condensables and causing them to plug. So uh, we, fit, we put that practice back in place, problem went away. So we got some early wins, but after a few years, the initiative began to lose steam. We found out that uh, acceptance was varied by site. We did have some plant managers, individual plant managers that were somewhat resistant to it. Um, uh, operations became disillusioned with the autonomous maintenance stuff because, you know, they were, they were, when they clean the machine and they find something wrong that they couldn't fix it at the time, they would write a notification in and hang a red tag on the, on the piece of equipment that was, that was causing a problem. Three months later, still a bunch of red tags all over the system. We also found that we could, we could do a really good job of RCM analysis. We did a really bad job of RCM analysis implementation. And so we were, we were wondering what was going on. So, you know, the response to the issues, we, we started looking at our, our process data. We were able to get some metrics now. We found we had still had a lot of opportunity for improvement. Um, we developed an audit process on that future state design, and we found out that the, uh, a lot of the work management stuff wasn't going very well. So uh, true planning wasn't occurring. So we weren't gaining the workforce efficiencies that we thought we needed to make. Uh, we were doing PMs, but they weren't effective at preventing failures. We're still having breakdowns and predictive maintenance wasn't as effective as it could have been. And then the aha moment occurred. An issue of Maintenance Technology Magazine, which is, um, uh, forget what it's named now, but this was way back when. Uh, issue of Maintenance Technology, Manage or Maintenance Technology Magazine came out and there was an article in there written by Brad Peterson, the late Brad Peterson, who incidentally was the, the um, he owned a Strategic Asset Management Incorporated, a consulting company, but he also um, was the, certif the, the certification chair before Smurtco became Smurtco, okay? And he was the, he got certification number one, okay? Because he was the chair, all right? But he wrote this article that talked about how you implement reliability uh, solutions and introduce everybody to the SAMI pyramid, okay? I don't know how many of you have seen this, but it's still out on, on the website. But this aha moment, if, if you take a minute to look at this pyramid, the foundation is planned maintenance. Get your work management process in a, in a place where it can efficiently handle the work that you generate. What we found is that the new work that was being generated by the autonomous maintenance, the new work that was being generated by RCM were constipating our process. We are, it was not working as, as good as it should. We did not put as much effort into shoring that up first as we should have, okay? So, um, we put the autonomous maintenance program on hold. We put the, the, uh, the RCM analysis program on hold and went to attacking this, okay? Then a significant event happened, okay? We got sold. Four of the sites went to one company and we all went with, that, with those four sites. Uh, two others went to another company and, and one other went to another company. And if you think SAP is hard to implement, try breaking it apart, okay? It's almost impossible, all right? But the good thing is the new owners saw reliability as a strategic advantage, and they saw what we had put in place, and they compelled us to accelerate those efforts. And they were behind it, and they were willing to do the things necessary um, to, uh, uh, to, do, uh, to make progress. And some of the financing of the sale was a bet against future performance. So we really didn't have a choice. So we also got some gifts from the new owners. 
Uh, one of the gifts was a very well-defined work process that was, it was similar to what we had in place. It was, you know, identify work, approve work, plan it, schedule it, execute it, document it, the standard work process, but it had a lot more detail in it and a lot more, um, a lot more uh, of the steps that are required to actually execute a given piece of the work. Uh, the prior work process that we had defined was mostly SAP driven, okay? This had a lot more detail in it. They also brought the, the mentality that no failure is acceptable. So they challenged us to, to do some level of root cause analysis on every single failure. They brought with us the, a process, a three level process, depending on the impact of the failure on business performance, you could have a cross-functional team to do analysis. Uh, the reliability engineering people got the kind of the next tier of problems, but we also got the craft workforce engaged in the routine failures that happen uh, day to day, okay? And they also drove increased accountability, especially at the leadership level. Uh, so we implemented a revised work management process and we put up an audit system in place to make sure it was being followed. Uh, the audit system was pretty simple. Anyone, we selected a relatively complex work order that had been completed. And we took in the conference room, the requester, the, the planner who planned it, the craftsman who executed it, their supervisor, and uh, the storeroom attendant who kitted the parts, everybody who had anything with that work order. And we brought in also all the data that was produced during each one of those steps. So it became painfully obvious when they were sitting in that room, if they didn't assign the right priority code, give a good description, if we didn't plan it effectively, if we didn't uh, fulfill the, the, the kit correctly, it became painfully obvious. And public embarrassment is a great change management tool. Just say, okay. Uh, we, we also uh, had site reliability audits. Uh, by this time, I was, I was in uh, a corporate leadership role, but, and I reported to the guy who the plant managers also reported to. And he was a little bit impatient with, uh, with improving business performance. Uh, so he, he made me dig into their SAP systems, find out areas where uh, they had known deficiencies, so we could both go to the sites, do this audit, highlight those deficiencies, and he could provide some expectation setting. And that's exactly what he did, okay? And then we implemented the level C root cause analysis at the craft level. Uh, it was adapted from the seven cause category approach that is in um, the, the book, Machinery Failure Analysis and Troubleshooting by Heinz Block and Fred Geithner. Um, and uh, their philosophy was that there are only seven ways, seven cause categories that equipment will fail unexpectedly, okay? And by using process of elimination from looking at the dead parts, talking to the operator, looking at equipment history, spending only about 20 or 30 minutes of your time doing that, you can generally rule out five or six of those cause categories as being probably not the one and zero in on, on, on the one. We also set up all our cause codes in SAP to fit those cause categories. And then we trained the, the crafts at each one of the sites and they were trained very, very well because I did it, but anyway. So, so these are the, the cause categories. The faulty design um, material, faulty design means the equipment is not designed for what you want it to do. Um, material defects are just that, flaws in the materials used. Fabrication and processing errors means the equipment is not fabricated correctly. Processing in this case is, is things like surface finish or heat treat or some of those factors. Uh, assembly and installation defects, it wasn't put together right. It wasn't installed in the field right. Uh, off design unintended service conditions, that means it, it was, uh, was designed right, but we've made a process change that makes it no longer capable of doing what we need it to do. Maintenance deficiencies are problems with the PM program. We didn't maintain it correctly. And then improper operations, everybody's favorite. Operators did something or that they shouldn't have done. 
or they didn't do something that they should have done that, that resulted in killing the equipment. So the results that we saw out of this initiative with this renewed focus were uh, significant maintenance cost reductions. I'll get to some of those results here in the next slide. Significant OEE improvement. We didn't have a universal way to, to measure OEE at all the sites, but each individual site had some OEE improvement things and they were significant. Um, uh, and I remember at, at Sam's site, one thing that, that really hit me when I was, I was at one of their communication meetings, that the plant manager put up a slide that showed, here's our break even volume over time, the, the volume needed to break even versus actual production volume. So break even volume was going down because they were reducing cost, Production volumes going up because they're improving capacity. All right, and that, that really resonated with me. Um, the, the site, you know, that where I got laughed out of the leadership team meeting, they, had, they, had, they ended up doubling their uh, business case results. Um, we had, we, we were tracking cost of reliability events, those major reliability events that, that cost you a lot of production, steadily declining over time and uh, significant benefits in procurement of reducing costs and, and uh, improved service levels, as I mentioned. It, this is a chart of the four sites um, that uh, look at tracking it. The maintenance spending is a percentage of replacement asset value. The benchmark value for this industry is somewhere around 2%. Um, I was at the, the dark blue plant. Uh, at our base year, we spent $39.1 million in maintenance. We had 200 maintenance craftspeople and on average 250 contractors at that site at that point. In year seven, we spent $17 million and we had uh, 173 maintenance craftspeople and six contractors just by making work go away. So if you notice that all the sites started at different points, and some had to make some investments, but they all got to about the same, the same place, okay? Um, and one of the sites, Sam's site, and you can ask him about, about this, we probably don't have enough time to go through it in detail, but, but his site was a chemical plant that had you know, a whole bunch of distillation columns and tanks and piping and heat exchangers, fired heaters, miles of piping, and a whole bunch of centrifugal pumps, over 1,100 centrifugal pumps. When they started this initiative, they started measuring mean time between failure of these centrifugal pumps and their average life was nine months. That means they were going through about 1400 pump replacements a year, which is about four a day, okay? So if you think about that, you know, they've got a bunch of people taking pump power ends out, sending them to be rebuilt, slapping some new ones in and somebody else is rebuilding those pumps. So, um, they studied the failure code data in SAP. Sam assigned a really smart guy to look at the failure code data, these, this, these seven cause categories, and take a look at, at uh, where are we losing? What, what are the ones that, are, that, are, uh, that keep cropping up? So they found that they had some, some design issues, uh, some around mechanical seal type uh, for the service, uh, some around basically a, a flimsy design when, the, when the, uh, that location required a more robust design. Um, they, they found that they had some assembly and installation defects. And if you think about it, that many pump replacements a, a day, you know, it, you, you're going to make some mistakes in, in, in installation and you're going to make mis some mistakes in, uh, in assembly. So they implemented a, a, a precision centralized pump repair facility where they did a precision job on repairing the pumps. They also ratcheted up expectations on field installation, attacking things like um, uh, corroded uh, foundations and grouting, uh, uh, bolt bound situations, pipe strain, all that type of stuff, doing an a, a precision uh, installation alignment job in the field. And they also found that, that there was a lot of them that were improper operations, in some cases, the operators were doing some things wrong, specifically around startup and shutdown that resulted in pump deaths. They implemented an operator training program to, to 
teach operators how pump how pumps work and how to properly care for them. And um, and they designed and implemented that programmatic solution for each one of those issues, and the improvement was was pretty dramatic. This was this was what they got. Um, nearly uh, in this time frame, it was nearly five years. But you told me yesterday that they peaked out at five point two. Yeah, that's that's pretty strong there, folks. That's an ANSI in suction centrifugal pump. So that's that's about as good as it's going to get. So some of the key learnings that we had through this initiative is it's impossible to implement advanced reliability solutions until the foundation is solid. You got to be able to get the work done before you can start attacking anything else. So work process is always first. But focusing on those fundamentals will provide a springboard for success in the future. It will enable things, some advanced technologies to bear full fruit that they should. Uh, you gotta have active leadership in place to drive culture change. Uh, we had one of the plants that act, had active resistance from the, the plant manager, he was replaced, okay? So they had the guts to, to, do, to take the hard road when necessary. And change management, is at least imp as important as the technical solution, if not more important, because you're gonna have a lot of opportunities to do change management stuff. Some of the things that we did right were we created inter-site reliability teams where the, the, the rotating equipment folks and the instrument and electrical folks got together on a periodic basis, share lessons learned, share failure history, things like that. Um, and also a predictive maintenance team so that, that we would continue to learn. Uh, we maintained that corporate reliability support. We had a rotating equipment uh, engineer. Uh, we had an ENI engineer that were on staff and, and, uh, and also uh, providing support for maintenance leadership. And then that ongoing SAP support was, was a critical thing. But some of the things we did wrong that you may want to avoid if you have this opportunity in the future, um, again, I mentioned we, we started those advanced initiatives before we had a good solid foundation under us um, and they floundered. Uh, the materials catalog, remember I mentioned that, that we implemented in seven sites in one year. Um, the only time that we had between sites was just a couple of months. So we took the approach of just appending each site's catalog to the master uh, by the time we were done, uh, it, it, we, we had over 200,000 SKUs in our item catalog, seven different descriptions for a 16 ounce ball peen hammer. All right, so we didn't do any deduplication. So we had to sign some resources at corporate level for, for a period of years to deduplicate it. We got down to, to around 50,000 items. So we took it from 200,000 down to 50,000 items. But what that meant was, we, every time they went to delete a material item number, we had to update the BOM on that equipment. So we had our planners doing a lot of wasted effort, if you will, had we, had we not made that mistake. We decided to self-design um, and self-implement, and nothing in the future state design was all that unique. We could have gotten some help from a, from a consultant who does this stuff for a living to help us out and maybe accelerated the benefits. But, but when John and I were talking about this, he put a, a bug in my ear, he, he's, and he's exactly right. That future state design team that went out and did all the benchmarking became very passionate um, evangelists for this because they knew what good looked like. They had seen good. So uh, that actually helped us going forward, okay? Um, and then we we didn't really have enough change management. Like I said, it's one of the most important things you can do. So that's about it. Um, do we have any questions? And remember, if you got a question, hit to a microphone, okay? I must have explained everything really, really well. 
I don't know, Sam, did you want to make any comments about it? Or John, did you want to make any comments about your experience through this? <laughs> uh, use the microphone. Okay. One of the really key things that went on is after the acquisition was we set good goals, reward systems, and all of our fundamental business metrics rolled down to individual and team scorecards. And we paid particular attention to managing by leading indicators. Okay, and particularly where all the work processes where the gears mesh, you better make sure they're synchronized. Mm -hmm. So on some key things like schedule compliance, who do you beat up if you don't make the schedule? Well, in our organization, the maintenance organization and the person in operations who had release authority for the equipment were both equally accountable and they sunk and swim together. Operations had goals set for improvement of reducing breakdown work orders because some of them are driven by, you know, technical limitations of the equipment, but quite a number are driven by this psychology. You know, asking one supervisor, what's your work process? He said, when it breaks, I call Clarence or Gaines and tell him to get it at, down here and fix it. Yeah, okay. We also apply that to some things like proactive, uh, uh, did they uh, PM completion? PM compliance metric was a manufacturer, was an operations and maintenance shared objective. So we were all in the, we were no longer team A against team B. We were the offensive and defensive parts of the same team. And like I say, it was very measurable. We held people accountable for the behaviors that would drive those lagging indicator results. And on our site, that was, that was huge gains. Mm -hmm. When we started measuring uh, how effective are you at acting on our predictive maintenance findings, we had all kinds of great analysis, but little action. It started out at 15%, 15%, 85% of it was wasted. It wound up at 98% at one point in time. And it was all by communications, shared objectives, everybody being on the same playbook. So I, I it's a critical success okay. factor for all part of the team. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Don, could, could you get to a microphone? Because we're live streaming this and the, the or, or actually just, just ask me the question if you want to and I'll, and I'll, I can repeat it. I'm up. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Bruce, you mentioned parts kitting. Yes. Did you do any parts delivery to the job site? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. As a matter of fact, uh, at, at Sam's site, they had actually an off site building that they did all the receiving and kit assembly. They adopted a philosophy that we're going to, for planned work, we're going to order from off site and not use in-house stores un unless we have to because of delivery lead times. Once the kit was assembled, it was delivered to a secure location in the work area. There was a cage that the, the maintenance person had a, had a key to and had a little butler building in that for things that couldn't be stored out in the weather. And, uh, and that's how they, they did their kitting and delivery. A great deal of time is lost traveling from job site to missing parts yep. and back again. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. As as Sam said, they were about eighty five percent uh, kitted work. John, your turn. I guess the one thing I would emphasize you said about the don't underestimate the level of change management. Yeah, it's a challenge within one single site. I think we would all know that, but to have that occur across seven sites we had an executive sponsor that walked around with his finger in the air one solution yeah. for seven sites yeah and yeah that was I, also very important because he was a big driver of that yeah and i i'll never forget when when he came to the site that i was at the, the executive sponsor came in he said i've implemented four maintenance systems in my career this is going to be the last one 
we are going to dismantle the past and hardwire the future. And that, that, that was sustained up until he moved on. Okay. But having that exec executive sponsorship is pretty critical as well. Okay. I think you just touched on another question. You know, you mentioned the great gains that were gotten initially. Everybody's really excited. Yeah. And then sometimes you tend to lose all of us some energy uh, because of management changes or your sponsor leaves or maybe the results start to flatten out. Can you elaborate again a little bit more on what you did to really keep that trajectory in spite of things, maybe people starting to get disillusioned, et cetera? We got sold. <laughs> that, that was really the, the trigger is because the new owners started driving again. Okay, we, we had, you know, the, the our executive sponsor who was driving it moved on after a few years. We tried to sustain it, but we did plateau. But then we were fortunate to get to get acquired by this company that continued to drive us. And that's what helped us helped us make progress. 